Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to ENM 2020, and we're in work. It, we are in week 33 now. Um, so we are in the final segment of the course as far as lectures, which is to say we are uh, looking at frontiers. And so we had a, a four really neat talks and then one from me. Um, but the, the four initial talks were from Michael Kearney, who uh, has been one of the, the global leaders in, thank you, in uh, developing mechanistic models of ecological niches. And um, so I, I hope we can concentrate on that. Um, I also talked about virtual worlds and, and what they can teach us. So um, we have a bunch of questions and, and hopefully this group, uh, Michael, Mona Papage, Marlon Kobos and Jorge Soberon and I, hopefully we can give you some reasonable and cogent answers. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and let's look at some of the questions, okay guys? Okay, who has a question that looks interesting? <clears throat> that, that's an interesting one, if you don't mind, Michael. Uh, what other process, oh, yeah, sure. apart from thermodynamics, can we take into account when using mechanistic models? Yeah, that's a good question. And hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I guess what I was saying in the in the lecture was that it's a good place to start because those processes never stop, <laughs> so you can't escape from them. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's I guess some, um, and I also didn't talk about um, some aspects that we would include within that that group. So I didn't talk about water at all, um, and. I didn't really talk about the feeding process. Um, so that's another thing that's part of the energy budget, but that's another thing that you could, you, you know, you could include. So, you know, in terms of just all the inputs and outputs of mass and energy, you know, th there's, there's a lot more than what, what I discussed there. Um, but I, I think there were some other questions about biotic interactions, I think, and, and certainly these you could bring into um, a mechanistic model. Um, and you know, one very simple way of doing that, for instance, is looking at overlap in activity time between a predator and a prey or, or competitors or a parasite um, and a host. Uh, so, so you know, there, there are other processes that you could bring in that are at the level of the individual. Um, I mean, some of you in this Q&A session might have some other ideas of those sorts of things, but yeah, and you can also take it up a level to the population, of course, as well. So there's a whole suite of population processes that you could link to the mechanistic niche model outputs, especially with respect to the um, life history outputs of the dynamic energy budget model. So survival, growth, reproduction. How much does that magnify the computational time or the the complexity of of the models if you know maybe we had a host and a parasite or two competitors? How much does that magnify the amount of work involved? Well, um, yeah, you would you'd want to have a very specific interaction of interest, I think. Um, you know you wouldn't be able to I think at some at some point you can incorporate the effect of the biotic environment just as a like a cost factor on the, on, you know, the, an inefficiency of the feeding perhaps or something like that, right? So then you, but, you know, getting really specific about a, 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 a tight interaction between two species, um, obviously you need to know about the parameters for those two species well enough to, to do it. So, you know, it's two species now. Um, yeah, so, so it certainly adds, you know, it adds to it, I guess one, but the complexity point's an interesting one. And I think, if you're going down into the details of inter mechanistic interactions between between organism and environment, or between organism, environment, and another organism, it, it does get there, there's a lot going on. But I think the power of these kinds of models is that even though they may seem complex, they're actually about as simple as you could make them. Um, and because of their mechanistic nature, you can throw complex sequences of conditions at them. They can handle complex sequences of environments, if you like. So, 
you know, if, if, you, if you think about just temp the temperature of an object, um, you, could, you could set up a weather station and, and an object and measure its temperature ne nearby and you record the humidity and the radiation and the wind speed and you record all of these things and you do it under lots of conditions and you build a very complicated model or detailed model with lots of parameters about how temperature changes as a function of those environmental conditions. But you need lots and lots and lots of input data to get, and, and, and probably quite a, you know, an ugly looking statistical model with lots of parameters to actually capture that. Whereas with the physics, it's actually, um, you know, the processes are understood. And so if you can get enough data to get the parameters of your thing, you know, whether it's, you know, whatever the object is, like, um, then you can put it on Mars and it will tell you what the environment, you know, what the temperature of that thing will be on Mars. So, so that, that's, you know, the, even though these models are inherently, they, they, you know, it's hard to do them. I mean, I, it's, it's heavy stuff and it's taken me ages to get my head around this sort of stuff. And I'm certainly not someone who it comes naturally to, but, but they are able to give you very complex answers out of, you know, complex sequences of environments with relatively simple um, equations. Tony. Yeah, I got it. Um, another question. Anybody have one in particular that they are wanting to look at? Probably I have one. It's for Michael, though. <laughs> it's not okay. for me. Sorry, Michael, That's... we're putting you on the spot. What, oh, it's, it's fine. One. It's 2957. 2957. Okay, how can we measure and present uncertainty? when using mechanistic models, given that some assumptions are made and some terms in the equations are being simplified? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, and, and it's a front, I mean, this is a frontier topic, right? So I don't think this problem has been dealt with, um, you know, in sufficiently in, in the field of mechanistic niche modeling. I, I sort of feel a bit like the stage is set. We've got a hold of tools we know you know, that they work reasonably well in that we can predict things that we see happen in nature, like what soil temperature does, what soil moisture does, and that sort of thing from a microclimatic point of view. We can predict body temperatures of animals running around in the field in complex microclimates and that sort of thing. And we can, we've done a few attempts at predicting an actual distribution and, you know, there's been situations where we can, but the, yeah, you can sort of imagine the growth of this field involves obviously collecting a whole lot of trade values sure. and we need databases of this and dealing with the uncertainty in our estimates of those values. And I think um, one aspect of this is working out what are those sensitive parameters and that you can ask of the model, you just do sensitivity analyses, but it's not so straightforward to do a sensitivity analysis with these kinds of models as it is with other models, because there's so many, um, sequences of environments that could happen, right? So, um, yeah, so it becomes a little bit specific. And, and I guess you also want to, you know, for different situations, different processes might be more or less important. And so you want to focus on the uncertainty and the parameters to do with those processes. Um, for instance, quite often people immediately start thinking about temperature limits with this sort of thing. And, you know, upper temperature limits is a, is a very topical one. But for a whole lot of species, it might be pretty unimportant because they can always get away. They can always go underground or something like that. It could be that it's all to do with the phenology and knowing the timing of the egg hatching. And then you really need to re um, pin down the egg development. Or it might be, um, yeah, just the, the time it takes to mature. The timing of phenological aspects might be really critical. And, and, and that's where all the effort should be invested. So, you know, the, the exact photo period, you know, signal that, caught, that that triggers the reproductive cycle might end up being the thing you really want to nail down well and that is quite sensitive and 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 you need to put effort into that so it's it's um it's not a straightforward answer but i think it needs to be very biologically guided is my you know my answer to that and we've talked quite a bit about how how just in these in these question and answer sessions you know we think of niche as a, a translation of physiology but it's really a translation of physiology combined with behavior and phenology. Absolutely. And 
And you know, that can make for major adjustments to those, those physiological limits. Sorry, Jorge, yeah. you were gonna say something. Well, it's in that line. And uh, although it's not specifically in the questions, I think it will be a good moment to ask you, Michael. Uh, this is one of the things we deal with all the time and it's, it bothers us a lot. One thing is what happens at the level of the physiology of the animal or the plant, the physiological temperatures, the, the temperature the, the, in the interface between the skin and the air and things like that. And another, mm -hmm. the climatic um, um, temperature that you get from say, world clean. I really would like to hear your, 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 your thoughts on this. I know that you have been modeling microclimate, which is much closer to the yeah. physiological aspect of the, of the, of the organism. But it's, 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 well, it's one of the things that bother us all the time. What are we really doing between physiology and climate? There is a, a lot of stuff. I would like to hear There's your a lot thoughts. of stuff, yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, it, it is fun to try and think. I mean, you know, when you do say when you do have a reasonable handle on what might be limiting a species, and then you, you say, well, what would I have gotten if I ran a, a coral lid model? And how would I interpret those response functions? And I'm not, and we, we haven't got a whole lot of examples to, 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 to sort of see that, but you know, for a lot of, say, cold-blooded animals that need shade, you could be, what you're picking up with your relationship with rainfall and temperature could be all about plant growth and how that casts the appropriate shade or provides the appropriate habitat. So you've got this, you know, quite an indirect effect. Um, but, you know, in other cases, it might, it might actually be more of a mapping between some physiological sensitivity and the, and the environment. So I think it's, it's a frontier. It's an open question as to what those actual links you're able to implicitly capture in your statistical models are. Um, I find that an exciting question too. It's it's like you've got these, you caught these things and you don't know what they are, but you know, what, I was talking a bit about how, how can we use these things together? And I think trying to think through um, where we have good cases, where we understand what's going on from a mechanistic point of view as more of these cases come about and then we compare what we're getting from the statistical models, we might start to see some patterns that, you know, uh, spe or group specific, you know, where, you know, in some groups it isn't a very indirect relationship with vegetation and, and in others it's, you know, more, more a proximal connection. So, uh... I just, I'm just trying to understand all, all what it's been said. I will try to summarize. So basically, we will have to detect what are the parameters that are uh, that represent higher sensitivity in our model, not only statistically but also biologically uh, thinking, and like try to make more than one only assumption. Right? Uh, that will help us to represent something like kind of variation at least, if not uncertainty at least, I guess. In, yeah, in terms of the uncertainty, as you delving into a particular case and trying to understand it, yeah, you might use the model, the mechanistic models um, and, and vary certain parameters that you're getting information of from your empirical work are, are important, for instance, from your field work. And you can do experiments with the mechanistic models. I guess what's with those models, you're working at the same sort of time and spatial scale as the things you're measuring on the ground about the organism. So you can see, are they behaving the way I expect? Are they coming out at that time of the same time of year? Is the growth rate consistent when I measure the growth rate in the field? So, so the, you know, the, the thing you can do with these models is have a very, very close connection with your field work and your laboratory work. So the, you know, you have a um, experimental and theoretical sort of um, conversation going on. And that's helping you decide on what are the really important aspects of this whole scheme. You know, you can see that that scheme I tried to show with water, temperature, food. That's a good whole scheme to be sort of starting with and having in your mind as you approach a problem. But then going down into the details of a particular species, things will become apparent as being more important than others. And that's where you, went, you put your emphasis in terms of the parameter estimates that you might need to measure empirically. And then yes, you need to 
um, incorporate the uncertainty you have of those parameter estimates appropriately into the predictions. But but you can't. What I'm sort of trying to say is you can't do it for every single parameter. You have to be homing in on the limiting factors, and that's really the art of this kind of modeling. It's like homing in on the limiting factors as quickly as it can. Often that requires a fair bit of natural history and biology. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's look at another question in the, from the, the participants. Anybody have one in mind? How about 2959? Um, at least taking the essence of it, uh, how transferable are the mechanistic models? Uh, okay, so I would interpret that as across organisms. Yeah, I, I was thinking of, of across places, but maybe I'm maybe I'm misinterpreting okay. what the question was. Well, um, the transferable across places, yeah, that's highly transferable because that's getting the microclimate right. Mm -hmm. So as long as you've got that right, um, you know, and and the inherently those those sorts of models are quite are transferable. Um, particularly for direct uh, influences rather than the indirect ones like what you what you described with the microclimate really driving the vegetation and the vegetation driving the organism. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, you know, if you've, you've worked out in one place, this is how, you know, this is how my organism works and I've got a good model for it. It should work in another place. And, that, and that's, you know, that if you do have a good model, then you know, you're not so much extrapolating, you're just running it in another place. So in that sense, yes. Um, there's another way, I guess you can think of them as being transferable. And that um, at, at a certain level, you could say all s sort of smallish balls of flesh with feathers on them that are endothermic, right? You, they will all have a similar kind of set of constraints and, you know, all little sort of grasshopper type things that live for one year and lay eggs shallow in the soil, they'll all have a similar set of constraints. So there will be things you can infer from this kind of modeling that will be quite generally relevant to a functional group or whatever. So that, you know, there's transferable notions from that point of view as well. Um, from an organism. So you could take your, your house sparrow model and transfer it to tree sparrow model because they're the same size and same plumage yeah. characteristics. Yeah. Now there may be some very you know important differences in the way that they regulate under high temperature. Like one might pant first, and the other one might raise core temperature first. And so, but there'll there'll be you know very similar constraints acting on them because they're the same size. So sometimes you know the the differences are more subtle in terms of behavior or this species might have a diapause and this one doesn't, but they otherwise look identical. So looks can be deceiving, but at the same time, from a yeah, physical constraint point of view, there is some genera certain generalities they can't escape from being that size or being endothermic. Or, or at the very least, you would think that many of the basic features of the model would be the same and you would just tweak oh, yeah. based on the, the details of the natural history. Yeah, that's right. So, and that has a lot to do with, you know, how much can you simplify the problem? So, um, you know, that example that I showed with the lizard, that's about as simple as you can make it. And you know, I got rid of that area out of it, but only because then in that occasion, we're assuming that the area involved in convection is the same as the area involved in solar exchange and infrared exchange and so on. But that that may not be relevant, you know, or a suitable assumption to make in certain circumstances. And say we're thinking about an elephant, right? I mean, someone may ask the question about ears and things. And so for some organisms, actually, yeah, it's really important the way that the legs are functioning or the way that the ears are functioning in thermoregulation. And so you would need to, you might take the general equation for, you might consider a spher spherical elephant, right? <laughs> but you use exactly the same equation. You might make it a bit more of a cylinder, but then you might add four cylinders for legs 
you use exactly the same equations for the legs, but you bolt them together. And then you might have an ear. There's a great, there's, so someone did ask about ears and there's a great paper by James Heath on dumb, trying to use biophysics of, of um, an elephant ear where they had done a more serious scientific paper working out, could they be used to cool? And then they thought, well, now let's see whether we can infer whether Dumbo could actually fly. And it's, it, it think, I think it's in the Journal of Thermal Biology and they conclude that because they were trying to work out the heat generation and whether the ears were dissipated. But that, that's an example of how you would take the same theory, but you just build it up and combine it in different ways. But it's a more complex model, more parameters, you know. Sure. It's uh, one of the questions there is asked whether you can do the same with plants. And I know that you can, Axel Clyton and Hal Mooney and others have done similar stuff. It's, uh, posing the, the fundamental equations of the physiology of the plant and then... Yeah. Uh, but maybe you can also elaborate on, on how, what are the problems of doing this for plants rather than for, for animals? Yeah, yeah. Um something I probably couldn't have answered very well a few years ago, but I did have a student um, work on developing a plant model and he, we just got the proofs of the paper. So there's one coming out soon. And um, I, I mentioned his GitHub repository right at the end of the very last lecture. So you, you can click on that link and you can see that model and there'll be a paper describing it. But that was a case of trying to do a whole life cycle model of the plant from a, um, using that dynamic energy budget theory. Um, most models of plants, they don't have the whole um, ontogeny. They might be of the tree, le tree stage, you know, or, or, um, but they're not connecting a seed, going through its ontogeny and growing up. And there's a lot that's been done on the functional traits in terms of the surface areas of the leaves and things. That, but yeah, what, what the model that, that Raf, um, Raf Shouten, who, who, who did this project, um, did I mean he took an existing set of ideas, simplified them so they can actually work, and it's this dynamic energy budget theory applied to a plant. And just briefly, it's like the roots and the shoots are two organisms living symbiotically, where the roots are obviously taking up nitrogen, the shoots are photosynthesizing, and they're sharing um, the spoils between each other. So it's like a symbiotic relationship, and the the plant sort of grows in harmony from that in that way. And the dynamics of lopping off the leaves and what that how the leaves will grow back given that you've already got the, the roots and so on. That all just naturally emerges from this. And so does the starting off as a seed and, and, and the tra trajectory of growth. And for me, as an animal biologist, thinking about thermoregulating animals moving around, gee, this was fun to think about because, you know, what is the temperature of a plant? Well, when, when you, so the other thing Raf did was to put that model into a microclimate. We never parameterized it for any particular plant. We just had this generic plant but we could make it grow in a real microclimate. So the roots are growing down into the soil and experiencing different soil temperatures, but also different soil moistures, right? Mm -hmm. Growing up and experiencing different air temperatures and radiant environments. And, you know, as you grow up higher above the ground, the, as I was sort of saying in one of those lectures, near the ground, the air is much warmer during the day. Uh, and there's an idea about the tree line being as you go up a mountain, eventually the plants can't grow too high or else they grow out of that warm boundary layer there. So there's really interesting things going on as the plant grows up and as its roots go down and during germination, it's, it's all about getting your roots down quickly enough so that you're out of that dry top layer that's really you know, fluctuating a lot. Yeah, so uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of plant physiology. A lot of this is well known, um, but there hasn't been a lot of mapping that from macroclimate to microclimate to plant physiology and, and looking at that whole life cycle perspective of plants. So that's a frontier. And I know I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it, but with that project, um, did a little bit. And it's, I actually really would like to do more. Another question? There are questions for you, Tom. Yeah, that's which ones? And and maybe town after you've answered your questions, we can think about virtual worlds with correlative and mechanistic models because that could be quite interesting. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, point me towards one, Jorge. Well, I'm looking at 29.70, but there, I, I saw another one that I liked more. Uh, I'm looking for it. I'll, I'll just comment on this question. So this is from Jean Ganglo in Benin. Um, thanks for the presentation, um, especially regarding the result on latitudinal diversity gradient. Uh, this, such predictions can be used to infer what has been done about latitudinal diversity gradients in the past and what can be done in the future. So, um, and then how would that contribute to conservation efforts? I think this may be more of a basic science result. Um, what, and so Jorge's in this, in this collaboration as well, as, as well as um, Hui Jie Chiao in China and Corey Myers and Aaron Saup uh, at New Mexico and at Oxford. Um, but essentially what we've done is to posit a species that has a very simple relationship um, to its landscape and environment. So imagine a species that has a fixed fundamental ecological niche and it has a dispersal curve that is also fixed, but it exists in on a landscape that has real world geography and that has climate change as has been observed in the real world over the, let's say the end of the Pleistocene and into the recent. So essentially all that our species does is disperse out from its current distribution, detect suitable habitats and inhabit them, suitable sites and inhabit them and uh, fall on infertile soil in other places and not inhabit those places. And obviously those distributional uh, possibilities change as the climate changes. So essentially what we were interested in was, you know, if you look at the latitudinal diversity gradient, there are 60 some hypotheses that have been proposed. And a lot of them include some really complex processes, like maybe uh, interspecific interactions are more intense in the tropics, and that might confine the realized niche to be much smaller than the fundamental. And again, there are, there are dozens of variants on these, on these ideas. And so rather than testing one hypothesis, we set out simply to ask, if we only include these very simple processes of niche and dispersal, climate change and real geography, if those are the only processes in the universe, what kind of diversity gradients result? And the answer is that essentially the kind of diversity gradients that we observe in the natural world are mimicked almost exactly by that, that very simple world of very simple species with just four processes, no interactions, no niche evolution. Okay, so that, that's kind of what we were after. And the translation to questions of biodiversity conservation might be more, more indirect. Go ahead, Harlan. jump in. But we, we applied the same scheme to the VESPA project because we did models using the same structural cellular automaton to the, to the VESPA, uh, to the VESPA mandarinia, which is uh, the, the so-called um, killer hornet or, yeah. Murder hornet. Murder hornet. <laughs> that, that horrible beast this size. Uh, and we explored possible scenarios using that kind of virtual reality model. So as long as you are disciplined with your, and you don't trust too much the, the model, you do use it to explore possibilities, I think it's perfectly possible to use them for applied purposes. Yeah, Which so, is what Jean is, is, is asking here or suggesting here. So in that situation, 
you have a new invasive species that's native to Eurasia. It arrives in the northwestern corner of North America, Western Canada, Northwestern US. It appears to have established populations there. Maybe, just maybe, it'll be possible to eradicate those populations. But this is a species that has very, very dramatic negative ecological effects, especially on other pollinators. And so the question was, first of all, what is its distributional potential across North America or the world? And we answered that question with just a simple niche model, correlative niche model, trained on the native distribution and transferred to North America. But that wasn't the whole story because obviously dispersal is going to shape which parts of that potential distribution get inhabited first. And so, as Jorge said, what we did was we said, okay, if this is what suitability looks like across North America, and we can make some assumptions about the dispersal abilities of this species, then what, what would be the geographic routes of invasion? It's, it's not prediction, it's scenario exploration. But what we were able to see is that under some circumstances, the species essentially hops from suitable island to suitable island from a fairly small potential distribution in the Northwest to a massive potential distributional area in the East. But under other circumstances, essentially the species has to go southward and then come north. So yeah, you're, you're perfectly right, Jorge. That was something that had very real um, applied um, implications for what would you do about this species. And I'll put that on the, the I'll put the preprint of that paper uh, on the course page so that people can read it if they'd like to. Any others? That is also an answer to 2966. Okay, then I won't go to 2966. So what I was thinking, Tan, oh, sorry, you go, Mona, because you haven't. Uh, sorry, I, I saw a question that uh, is also for you, Tan, since we are talking about virtual species. But I do have, <laughs> I do have a couple of questions about uh, mechanistic models and microclimate. But anyway, so 2971, I think, I think maybe is a quick question that you can answer, Tan, or has a quick answer, I don't know. <laughs> virtual species of host parasite models and what considerations should be taken into account for this type of relationship. So virtual species, you know, don't come with many characteristics of whether these are, you know, free living or, or parasitic or, you know, flying or terrestrial. They're basically just sets of assumptions about what shape the niche should have and the more sophisticated ones would come with some ideas about dispersal and movement abilities. Um, so virtual species and host parasite models, I don't, I can't think of any specifics of that, but really what it would come down to to make it a host parasite model would be some very specific assumptions about how these two virtual species interact with one another. So it might be, for example, that the, I'm thinking some of the, the snail-borne uh, macroparasites, um, it might be that the species has an environment that is you know, the gut of its host during most all of its life cycle but then there's one stage where eggs are shed into the environment and some larval stage then gets ingested by a new host. And so I think you'd have to make some kind of simplifying assumptions about when and how does the parasite experience the broader environment and then when and how do the host and the parasite interact. 
And so that's kind of taking us more towards a, a mechanistic model, uh, either like what, what Michael does or like some of the population models kind of in more class, classical mathematical ecology. Yeah, like you, if you have a, a host parasite interaction that involves say a mammal drinking from water and picking up the parasites that way, you could compute how often this thing's needing to go to water. Um, we're, we're playing around with this in chytrid in frogs, you know, the, um, the behavior of the frog, obviously chytrid, if you, if you don't know much about chytrid, it tends to get killed at high temperatures. So if frogs can behaviorally go to high temperatures or are enforced to be in high temperatures, then this may reduce their load. So you can, you know, you can capture the environmental aspects of that interaction that way. Mm. So, so I think that it comes down to, you know, as Michael just said, you, you're essentially taking your natural history information or, you know, the, the parasitologists always create their, their life cycles. And you have, to, you have to simplify that to a set of, you know, when this is doing this, this can happen in the other species. And when the other species is doing this, then this can happen in the first species. Yeah, and having some kind of modeling framework can lead you to different sorts of questions than you might otherwise have gotten to too. So it's a, it's a good structure for thinking, whatever the framework is. So in the, in the classic uh, theoretical ecology literature, the, the problem of uh, interacting pairs of species, be it competitors or predator prey or whatever, with spatial structure, well, the questions are posed, but they are horribly difficult to tackle either analytically, they are impossible, or because they are partially differential equations, non-linear, uh, or uh, computationally are very, very challenging. So I think that's, well, my own student, Luis Osorio, started trying to do a simulation of two species interacting in a realistic arena of thousands of cells. It, it's a system of ordinary differential equations tied with a dispersal kernel. And he had to stop with one species because of the computational problems. The, the, the numerical challenges were very serious and he ended having to, 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 to code in C, in C rather than in R and things like that just because of uh, numerical challenges. So there is a numerical challenge there I, I, I'm not saying that it's impossible, it's perfectly feasible to do it, and it will be in time, we will have simulations, including interactions, but interactions are complicated, and that kind of host parasite that produces oscillatory behavior, and very easily would lead to, to chaotic uh, behavior, it, it, it's a bit of a challenge. Especially when the spatial dimension comes in. Well, that, that's what makes it, that is what makes it difficult. For right. a single point, the theory has been there for forever. Right. You can imagine just a one-dimensional space. This population can interact with this population, but may interact less with this population, and not at all with this population. And so that was kind of back to my question to Michael about the computational challenges where you have something that was a big enough question for one species in one place, multiple places, it gets big, multiple species, it gets even bigger. Yeah, you gotta get the bite-sized pieces of the question, right? And, and see how you can simplify it. And sometimes you can't. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's yeah. why, you know, a lot of the classical population ecology is done with you know an island model, or in some senses it's more in some cases it's more tractable to have a continuous model. But any oh, and also, well, also yeah, you know, there's a lot of, bio, of mathematical biology that's done where the the real the fun is for the mathematical mathematician to to have a fun problem and they they use biology for it, but they they get beautiful answers to largely unrealistic questions or situations. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of amazing theory often for a given topic, but it's really for the entertainment of mathematicians and not so much for the practical use of biobiologists. I agree with you. <laughs> mm. Well, you know, when we talk about um, stacked species distribution models, uh, 
you know, my kind of amused reflection on that, if stacking works, which is to say if, um, if individual model predictions are what govern um, which species are present at a, at a place, rather than some secondary, more, more complex interactions of, of interactions between species. Gleason versus Clements. Yes. Uh, but that essentially means that, that all of the complex community ecology models are just kind of, as you say, entertainment for mathematical biologists rather than reality. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, sometimes, yeah, the, 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 the assumptions that are made just render it so far from any real situation that, like you say, with the spatial aspect missing or whatever, um, that, it, yeah, it isn't that much use. And, um, and but, that applies to everybody's models. I mean, in population and, genetics, the classic thing is, you know, imagine a haploid organism with one chromosome, right? You know, just they, they, they start with these assumptions where, okay, that makes it tractable, but it also may make it irrelevant. Yeah, so in some situations you can assume almost an infinite population and you'll get an inference that's useful and in other situations not. And, and, you know, in some cases it may just lead you to, to consider um, different ways things might be working than you might otherwise have imagined. And so, the, you know, it's played a role, but it's not going to give you a, a really accurate prediction for species X in place B. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. One, well, one thing I was thinking though, Town, you could take uh, one of these mechanistic models, set of parameters, and make it as a virtual species, uh, and then let it free across the landscape. And then, you know, so you put in a whole bunch of real, you know, realistic processes, and then you develop statistical models, you know, you have a process of dispersal and everything. Um, and then make correlative models based on that, that would be an interesting project, because that would at least start to get at the sorts of things that might occur. You can make it increasingly complex and see what this what the response curves look like and um and maybe get a sense of, of what might be going on with real correlative models yeah yeah that would be that would be exciting so there's a yeah, connection between virtual worlds and uh mechanistic models and it was it certainly the the complexity of the niche has been Something where I think the virtual species and the virtual world's efforts have started with the very simple and they're, they're moving, let's say step by step, but not quickly towards the, the highly uh, complex and more biologically realistic. Hmm. Let, let me say something and I would like to hear Michael's opinion. I think that the closer you are to the physics of a problem, the closer you are to, to, actual, to do actual calculations, not modeling, but you have the equations that govern the process and you calculate on those and you get results if you have the parameters. And, the, and, and you can trust those results a lot because they correspond to a real process. That is close to the physics. As soon as you start getting away from the physics and more into the behavior, the ecology and things like that, you start doing more models because there are no laws, there are no conservation um, equations, there, there are no symmetries, there are not a lot of things. And so you model stuff, but maybe the model is useful, but uh, we always have doubts about how good the model is re really is. So mm. it's, it's, it's this, this distinction, and that's why ecologists are said to be envious of physicists because <laughs> physicists calculate things and we model things. And I don't know if that is something of a valid um, <clears throat> distinction in your view, Michael. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, you could see that that is the distinction between a, a descriptive model that's capturing a pattern and, and a cap, you know, fitting a curve um, versus having a, a kind of formal theory behind. So, you know, you have a, a theory is basically a list of statements, a list of assumptions about how something's operating. And from that, 
clever people, not me, can draw the equations out. You know, usually by drawing a diagram, like, you know, I've watched Warren Porter and Bas Koyman actually make these models and they draw diagrams or, and, and they write out the equations, but it's from a set of assumptions. So the, the physics has a set of assumptions that we, you know, we're referring to and the models come from, from those assumptions. Um, and yeah, and you do have these powerful things like the conservation law with, with you know, physical Great. models. And conservation of, of, of energy, things like that. That's right. Three laws. Yeah. Conservation of time. But the, um, you know, you might have a stochastic model that's based on an actual stochastic process, probabil probabilistic model that you use for foraging, but it's a relevant model to that process. And it has, uh, so the yeah, behavior I agree is, is, is different, but you can bring in formal models of stochastic processes that capture behavior um, that might be, you know, more robust than, than a more of a descriptive model. Oh yeah, more than mm. just words and, 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 and arm waving, right? You write yeah. down the equation, you are forced to think in, 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 in a more disciplined way. That if or you, you have a clear set of assumptions and you know, so you can see where this is all coming from this list of assumptions. And if there's a problem with those, you know, if there are problems, you go back to that list, you know, and you, and you see which assumption is not correct. So that's sort of the, the theoretical biologist approach. Um, yeah, and, and the, whereas, you know, the equations don't have to come, I mean, the, say in a correlative species distribution model, the theory is coming from prob probability theory. So there's a whole lot of assumptions that you need to be aware of and about how probability theory is working, right? So one as that's one aspect of fitting a statistical model. So there's a different set of the theoretical you know, things to know about when you draw, when you're trying to estimate a probability, but it's a different set of, you know, different list of um, theoretical assumptions. You can't have a probability greater than one, that sort of thing. Yeah. I have a, like, kind of a comment and a question uh, related to what you were talking about before, the virtual world together with mechanistic models. And it's, uh, well, we were talking about like mechanistic models usually uh, depend on finding the biologically meaningful relationships or, or interactions of species with the ecosystem or with other species. And when you're saying about this, about combining with the virtual world simulation, uh, you're talking about a very coarse resolution of uh, a representation, the representation of the environmental conditions or other conditions at a very coarse resolution. And I guess it's related to some of the questions I saw there. It's a, uh, how how can you manage this uh, problem mm -hmm. that some of the key arguments or key parameters or key things that you have to consider when doing these models cannot be represented or cannot be catched by that course resolution? Yeah, yeah, no, I saw, I, remember, I saw there were a few questions along those lines, yeah. So um, with it, say with a microclimate model, um, say we're thinking of a thermoregulating lizard, which is something I think about a lot, um, what, what you're doing is you, what, well, one way to do this is a spatially implicit way where you say, here are the extremes of shade available in this habitat. Right? And then the organism is allowed to choose between those extremes. So you don't need to have, you know, you, you can be explicit and have the, an individual based model and an organism moving around, right? But, but you can do it simpler than that. And that may not be relevant in some cases, but often it is where you just say, look, if the shade is between zero and 90%, this is what the organism has available. And then the, and the model is basically choosing a level of shade between those as it goes through. And you're not being explicit about the shade. And also what these models are doing is that there's a two way thing going on between environment and organism. So the size of the organism, organism determines how high above the ground it is. And so what height, you know, what microclimatic um, height you, you you estimate the temperature at for your for your um, prediction, and that that may grow and change through time. So, you know, there, there's there's that that element of organisms determining the environment around them that is being captured in the models, and that helps. So so if you were to run, let's just say you wanted to make a virtual species, you run it across um, Ecuador, you could get your um, environmental layers and you know, run a simulation at a set of points. Um, and at each of those points, you're actually, 
yeah, you're taking that coarse climatic data and turning it into an hourly sequence of, of conditions and you're making it relevant to the height of the organism at that location. You could, if you really wanted to incorporate all the fine slope and aspect and everything, then, I mean, you could just brute force run it across. Or you could just, you could just say, I want to do a few different slopes and a few different for each, each point, do a few different um, analyses and then you maybe allocate them to pixels. But there's, there are ways to do it where you're able to capture what's going on as experienced by the organism at the microclimatic level, but still do it on a relatively large scale. I think you could, you could do a simulation that was realistic enough. Maybe it doesn't have every, you know, aspect of, you know, aspect and slope, fine resolution. Maybe it doesn't capture the various patterns in which shade is, is distributed, but it would be, you know, um, and, and all the different soil types and so on. It would all depend on the question you're trying to ask as to how far you needed to go with that. But yeah, um, I hope that that provides somewhat of an answer. But imagine, yeah, I mean, it'd be really fascinating to see um, what sort of environmental relationship would you actually get? Say, so you simulate a plant and you have a very simple um, response to soil moisture, you know, where they have a threshold wilting point, which will kill them, permanent wilting point, and um, some growing degree day, simple growing degree day model, right? Something simple like that, but it's mechanistic model of this response to soil moisture and you run the microclimate model to calculate the soil moisture. And that's using a whole lot of environmental factors, you know, temperature and rainfall and soil type. And then you make this simple plant grow and you see where it would you know, succeed and fail. And then you develop a statistical model of that. What would it look like? It'd be very fascinating to see. And I mean, this sort of thing, I think I was, I was heading towards this at the, in the end of the last lecture. In a real situation, if you were, say you, you do um, assume that there's some process going on that's important and you generate a, pro a very proximal physiologically translated layer that is something like growing degree days above a certain threshold soil moisture you know you can make that a metric um, and then you make a statistical model based on that you compare that to a model that's using all the same forcing data you use for the mechanistic model but in the raw form right just the climatic data that you would have fed into that mechanistic model and you do a statistical model with those parameters those input variables um, what should happen if you're on the right path is that that one predictor that you used should explain just as well as the 20 predictors you needed to make the proximal layer. I would suspect that the statistical model would be inside your, uh, because of this fundamental is larger than realized niche thing. So if you do the fundamental using uh, uh, first principles, uh, uh, processes of, temp of, of, of temperature budgets and water budgets and stuff like that, that should be larger than the observed statistical. And I, yeah. you, you have done that. However, on that. The, the counter argument, Jorge, is that if, if in a relatively coarse pixel compared to individual size or individual movements, you know, it may be that in this tiny sub pixel, I can find what I need. And so wouldn't that tend to make the occupied area broader i don't know but certainly that will complicate things but the know, interesting either. thing is that it might be that that you know, some relatively simple abiotic process is driving a lot of the dynamics and then if it were true then you would expect to see a re, you know a similarly good model from that one proximal predictor that's the general notion i'm trying to get at here that mm -hmm. you develop a proximal predictor that's based on the processes you think are important um, it could be, so the beauty of the statistical model is that it's going to um, capture all those, any, any of those um, other things going on that are somehow, maybe, you know, maybe it, the threshold isn't quite, you're not getting the absolute value from your proximal layer of so yes or no. You're getting a continuous layer though that relates to it. And so there may be interactions with other species and whatever that make it a narrower range, but it would be making the statistical model on the one proximal predictor versus the 20 distal predictors, it's all still with the same processes going on. And so 
it's all still realized niche to some extent, but it's, it's using that important driving factor. And if it is, you know, not, if it, yeah, I guess it, if it, if it doesn't fit anywhere near as well as using all those other predictors separately, then you know you're on the wrong track. If, it, if it's matching, then it gets exciting, but I'm not sure what to do next. Yeah. Okay, we're coming up on our hour. Um, any last comments or last reflections that anybody would like to throw out? I enjoyed this, this conversation a lot. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Michael, you for joining us. Mona? Can I, can I uh, ask a simple, well, a definition uh, question? So I've, I've been thinking about microclimates because I'm trying to measure, you know, with, let's say, I button temperature. I'm trying to measure soil humidity and, and vegetation structure with, with LIDAR. So I've been thinking about the use of microclimate versus, you know, coming from uh, ecological niche modeling using climate data. So when we use climate data, we, we try to be very careful and say this is averages over 30 years. Climatologists will, will be very upset if we use five years of data and we call that climate data. So, so we got trained as ecologists not to use climate for less than, you know, 20, 30 years of data. But then now I'm, I'm getting into measuring microclimate and I've been thinking is microclimate, are we, are we considering microclimate conditions at a much narrower, you know, year, two years, three years, four years, much narrower time frame uh, than, you know, the real climate long time, um, uh, time yeah. span? I mean, microclimate's kind of a silly term because it's not climate, it's micro weather. Yeah. Micro so, weather. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, so with microclimate, if you're doing physiologically and behaviorally, behaviorally explicit things, you have to have the microclimate because you can't connect what you've measured about the organism to them, you know, to something that's not the same scale, right? But microclimate can be relevant for other things. But in that case, um, yeah, you might get away with just using topography, right? Because if, you, if you're not needing to make that direct connection, um, then you may not, you know, you don't need necessarily the hourly, you know, um, values of air temperature and humidity and, and soil, soil moisture. Um, and it may be that, yeah, I think topo topographic indices and wetness indices and radiation indices that are corrected for topo topography and that sort of thing are fine if you're trying to statistically relate it. And maybe you can get some, as some uh, estimate of the variance going on mm -hmm. um, from your microclimatic data and use that like, but it's, it's sort of, the thinking's different. Like it, I just want to really make that distinction where you, if you have a measurement of an organism and you want to connect it to the environment, you have to have microclimate, but you're much freer with how you could use microclimatic data and um, the detail you need to go into um, if you're trying to draw statistical inferences. Okay. Kind of related to that comment, Mona, um, we have a, another frontier talk coming up, um, I believe for, for this Monday, it'll be from Kate Ingenloff, uh, mm -hmm. where what she's doing is taking us out of the long-term average world and taking us to a time specific world. Obviously it's, you know, down to the spatial and temporal resolution of your occurrence data and of your environmental data. Mm -hmm. uh, she essentially presents a framework for, you know, forget about using average data and use time specific data as an, as a modifying um, factor in, in, you know, what are the conditions of a place? Mm -hmm. So, and I'll just say at, at the very end of that last lecture I gave, um, I pointed to a bunch of resources for microclimatic modeling. Some things I've done and some things other people have done too. So there are some people were asking, how do you do this? There's, there's some tools. So if you look at the end of the lecture, you'll see the tools that are available. There's, there's gridded layers as well of microclimates. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for, for the discussion. I agree with Jorge, which is rare, but I agree with Jorge that <laughs> this was a, a fun discussion and kind of, 
getting me to think and getting us all to collectively think about you know linking between correlative and mechanistic models, linking between mechanistic models and and virtual species, virtual worlds. There's a lot of fun stuff in there. So thanks especially Michael fun for topic. Uh, yeah, it is you. what one in the morning now for you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good no night, <laughs> so kind of you. Yeah, well, thanks. It's a pleasure. I really enjoyed it, and nice to um, nice to meet some of you as well. And hopefully, we can see each other in person sometime in the future. I look forward to it. Thanks All a right. lot, Michael. You put a, a face to the name, Michael. <laughs>